we doing, everybody? I am so absolutely thrilled that you chose to spend your night with us. I want to tell you a little bit about what is about to happen. We are called Soul Collective, and through the course of the evening, you will hear more about what Soul Collective means. But I want to tell you a little bit about this show and how it came to be. So here's the thing. We get together and we throw out ideas for what a theme might be, and then we vote. So the theme that we voted on for this time was Unstoppable Warriors, Making Radical Change in Unexpected Ways. So tonight, you are going to hear some stories about folk who are making change in unexpected ways. And some of those will be people who are radical leaders, and some of those will be people who are folks who are hidden in the shadows, who we think their stories are transformative. So we hope you will enjoy them. I want to tell you a little bit about the process of how we come to these stories. So we meet uh, collectively on Zoom over several weeks, and I design a series of prompts to try to help people get in touch with stories. And so each week, we take different prompts, we look at them, we create stories, stories, and then by the end of our workshops, we ask people to settle on the story that they feel most moved by and that they're most interested in sharing collectively, and then we have a rehearsal to try to practice what it feels like to tell that story out loud. So I wanted you to understand that in the group tonight, we have people who have been telling with Soul Collective over the last few years since 2020 when we started coming together. And we have people who are telling with us for the very first time. So that's pretty exciting. Tonight we are celebrating a special partnership with Can TV. One of the things that is distinctive about Soul is that we like to start our performances with a group piece, something that kind of brings us all together. And the group piece is a way of honoring those who have come before us and calling their energy into the space. So we'll start with our group piece and then we'll go into a series of individual tellers where you will have a chance to see each one of these beautiful women tell a story from their heart. You matter to us tonight. We are so grateful to have you. And if y'all are ready, I think we're ready. We're going to get started. like to call into this space the energy of my beautiful friend Andrea Fain. Andrea Fain was a storyteller. She loved words and the magic that they bring and she loved black people. She wrote a beautiful poem called I Stand in Awe of Storytellers. She was wonderful to watch on stage. She had that kind of captivating presence. But more than that, Andrea was the kind of friend who would show up for you, be standing by your side when you were in a moment of crisis, be the person to call you when you weren't even thinking about it. She blessed my life. She is not here in the physical realm, but I feel her presence, and I'm so grateful to have her energy with us tonight. Andrea Fain, she is an unstoppable warrior. Unstoppable, unstoppable. I want to call into the space the spirit of Zora Neale Hurston for her fierce love of black stories, for passing them on, for keeping our language sacred, for the straight lick, for the crooked stick, for showing me through her living how to show up for yourself and expand into the full wonder that is black womanhood. She was unstoppable. Unstoppable, unstoppable. I want to call into the space a little girl, Ruby Renette Turner, who was born in 1924. She was the last of five children, born to a Creole family in New Orleans, Louisiana, and they called her Black as her nickname. She embraced her blackness 
And she taught us about kings and queens who were black. And now, as the fifth child of hers, I stand on her shoulders because she was unstoppable. Unstoppable, unstoppable. I want to give thanks tonight for my three grandmothers. Dorothy Beard Johnson, who I only knew in photographs. Allie Mae Trotter Goldsmith, who people tell me I look like and is my namesake. And Lillian Ball Johnson, whose laugh and smile could light up a room. The second two helped raise me, and they taught me unconditional love. And that love was unstoppable. I would like to call into this space the energy and the spirit of the musical icon Prince, who not only reimagined what black music and black musicians could be, but created a space to allow us to reimagine what all black storytelling and all black art can be. He was unstoppable. Unstoppable, unstoppable. I would like to call into this space my four mothers, the McKinney women of Mississippi, the Cheek women of North Carolina, and the Bird women of Chicago, Illinois. It has been their prayers that has carried our family through. They were unstoppable. I would like to call into this space this evening my dear friend Susan Peters. Susan left here far too early, but she was an incredible spirit. She was a writer. She believed in all things of the African diaspora. She even left the United States and lived in Liberia and raised her kids there for a while, and then came back here and became an author and became committed to addressing the social determinants of health through community health initiatives. She was fierce, she was a mentor, she was a mother, a grandmother, and a surrogate mother to many of us. I wanna call her spirit tonight, she was unstoppable. I'd like to make an offering of thanks to Marie Von Burden Brown for the invention of the video home security system. I was recently looking for a home security system because I wanted to make sure I felt safe and secure in my home with my kids. And their constant questioning of everything was running through my mind. The what, the where, the when, the why, the who. And so I got curious about who came up with this idea to begin with, did an internet search, and was pleasantly surprised it was invented by a black woman. Marie Von Brennan Brown in 1966 came up with this idea. She was a nurse living in Queens and wanted to feel safe and secure in her home. So she enlisted the help of her husband, Albert Brown, an electronics technician on the development. Now millions of people around the world, including me, utilize her invention. I'd like to also call into this space my dear friend, Kathy Gannigan. She was my mother-in-law, and today marks the one-year anniversary of her passing. She was a beautiful person whose light shone on everyone she met, and I will miss her greatly. Both of these women were unstoppable. I'd like to call into the space Faith Ringgold. She wrote Tar Beach. She was born in 1930. She died this spring at 93 years old. She was a feminist, she was an activist. She made quilts and she wrote books. Tar Beach is one of her seminal works. It is a quilt and a children's book. And what I love is the quilt because it shows black families having a good time over food and games while their children are safe, laying on a mattress, looking up at the New York night sky, pretending that they are flying over the George Washington Bridge. She was unstoppable.
right. Y'all ready for some stories? It is storytelling time. I'm Emily Hooper Lansana, Artistic Director of Soul Collective. Founded in 2020, Soul Collective was formed to support and elevate women of color's voices in the storytelling community and art scene in Chicago. Soul chose the name for many reasons. We are women of the sun, we speak with a soul ancestral heart spirit, and we are telling the stories of our lives. Soul Collective is an artistic response to the continued inequities of how women of color are seen, heard, and interpreted. We produce stories that analyze everyday life. Soul Collective is unique in its work to voice intergenerational connections and uplift universal experiences of humanity. Tonight's show is entitled, Unstoppable Warriors, Making Radical Change in Unexpected Ways. Consider the quote from Annabelle M. Ramos. And she will keep coming back to life over and over again, because beneath the skin of this gentle human lives a warrior unstoppable. We are excited to share the story of those who have inspired us by their radical vision. Our first individual teller tonight is Kara Irvin. Kara has been in love with stories since she first learned to read. She has always enjoyed reading books of any kind and writing personal essays. To this day, she never leaves home without a book to read. In recent years, Kara has expanded her love of stories to create her own stories, poems, and songs. This is her first year with Soul Collective or performing storytelling of any kind. Kara is a native of Chicago, currently residing in Bronzeville. Her story is entitled Ordinary Radicalism. Let's give it up for Kara. nervous, promise. When I first saw a performance of the Soul Collective a little over a year ago, I was instantly amazed. All these incredible women telling these interesting and thought-provoking and creative stories. It was really cool and I never really, you know, seen or seen anything like that before. And at the end of the performance, I kind of thought to myself, you know, I think I kind of want to do that. It combines two of my absolute favorite things in the world, which is sharing personal things about myself and speaking in front of large groups of people. <laughs> so, I mean, <laughs> I just, I raced to sign up. <laughs> and it, it took a while, like I couldn't coordinate my schedule and this, that, and the other, but finally this season I was able to do it, and I'm so excited. And the show that I first saw, um, the theme was something about a uh, spirit of growth or renewal or something along those lines, right? So we get to the kickoff meeting, and I'm like, all right, let's go, let's do it. And then, as Emily told you, we chose a theme. So I did this to myself. We chose unstoppable warriors making radical change in unexpected ways. And I thought, I've made a terrible mistake. <laughs> I'm not a radical. No one has ever called me a radical. I don't think my name and the word radical have ever been used in the same sentence and with good reason. And so now here I am, personal story sharing, public speaking me, trying to come up with an anecdote about being radical. And I was like, this isn't gonna work. I don't know y'all, it's not gonna work. I can't impress upon you how not radical I am. Like, I, that you, you think I'm joking, and I'm not. I'm, some of y'all out here, don't laugh. I'm soft. 
And, and, and don't get me wrong. I can be extremely unsoft when I need to be, but that's not my default. My nature is easygoing. I'm laid back. I like everybody to get along. I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. I'm quiet. I'm gentle. I'm soft. But I don't know how to be soft in a hard world. And we pay lip service to things like extending grace and showing compassion and walking in a spirit of kindness and peace and all of these wonderful things, but we don't mean it. Not really. I mean, we say we do, and I think we want to, but we don't. We value and exalt fierceness and bravery and leaders and risk takers and pioneers and the take no prisoners, right? And those are all great qualities to have and they should be admired, but they don't apply to a lot of us and they certainly don't apply to me. There are seven billion people in the world. Isn't that wild? I can't even really conceptualize a number that large, seven billion. It just sounds like words, right? And most of us, I think whether we come to it from a position of a belief in a particular deity or a particular faith, or whether we think the universe is completely random and everything happens by chance, most of us still believe that each one of those seven billion people is special in some way. And I think that's right. I think that we are each a very intricate combination of our skills and our dreams and our ideas and our talents and our experiences and our feelings and our thoughts and all of the other thousands of characteristics that combine in this very specific way that is not recreated in any of the other seven billion people on this earth. And so that means whether we're on a world stage, whether we're on a small stage like this, or whether we're just going about our everyday lives, each of us touches and impacts the people around us and our environment in a very special way that cannot be recreated by any of the other seven billion people on this entire planet. And so for me, in a world that has so many judgments and rules and expectations about who to be and what to be and how to show up, I think the most radical thing that I can do and the most radical thing that any of us here can do is to just be ourselves. Thank you. Thank you, Kara, and welcome to your Soul Collective debut. All right. Our second storyteller is Ruby Houghton Pitts. Ruby came to the Soul Collective in 2021 with a desire to learn from a diverse group of seasoned storytellers. Under the watchful eyes of the group, she has learned a great deal about the art of storytelling. She had her storytelling debut in the winter of 2022 and fell in love. She has worked most of her adult life as a business and nonprofit professional, where telling the stories of organizations was the key to her success. Nearing retirement, she decided that it was time to tell her own stories that have included international travel as a child and living or working in every region of the USA as an adult. She and her husband live in Chicago, have three adult children, and recently celebrated their second grandchild. Her story is entitled, Why HIV AIDS.
Good evening, everyone, and thank you for coming out tonight. It's wonderful to look out into this audience and not see everybody wearing masks. But I need to remind you that 7 million people died. 28 million people died with some other aspect of COVID attached to an illness that they had. So the other thing I want to remind you of is that HIV AIDS is still with us. And when I gave you that 28 million number for COVID, I need you to know that 85 million and a half people had HIV AIDS, and many of them are still living with it, but that 52 million people died with HIV AIDS. So we need to be aware that pandemics are coming in our time and that they don't just go away because we will them away. There's a lot of power that goes behind taking care of those things. So thank you for being here with your smiles. I know that some of you are still in masks and I have an appreciation for that. But I want to tell you a story about advocacy, advocacy. I was sitting in my office in 1988, and I felt her presence long before I ever looked up and I saw her. It was late. I was working late trying to get some things done. And she slid in and she said, hey, have you got a minute? I said, sure, come on in. So she slid into that chair and she leaned in and she said, I want to talk to you about my twin brother and the HIV AIDS walk. You see, he died last year. So I stopped and think, don't shuffle any more papers, listen up. So she told me the story of his life and how he hid and didn't tell her, didn't tell her parents, didn't tell anyone about that circumstance until it was far too late. She said, I want our organization to sponsor the HIV AIDS Walk for Prevention because too many people don't know about this disease. I wanted to say, oh no, mm -mm. I work in public affairs, government relations. That's not what we do here. But I didn't, I listened. And she told me more about that story and she captured my heart. So the very next day, after thinking about it and praying about it that night, I went to see the director of marketing and I told him her story and he said, oh no, we don't do that. We're a bank and banks don't do that. It's too controversial. So I wasn't deterred by what he said. I waited until my manager came in that afternoon. He had 30 years of service in the organization and I talked to him about it. You see, he was teaching me to be a good lobbyist. And so what I did was I advocated on behalf of the issue of HIV AIDS. And he told me to go ahead, just that casually, go ahead. So off I went with videos, with leaflets and pamphlets and putting together meetings inside an organization that owned 40% market share and had thousands of employees. Well, got a call from the president's office after a couple weeks with a cease and desist order. Well, I don't know if you've ever seen how teeny tiny bank logos are. They're about like this. Well, I had already ordered over a thousand shirts and across the back about this big was the logo of the company. It was a bright blue shirt with a white logo. They were already ordered and they were distributed. So I left out thinking, well, let's see what we can do. So we took our activities underground in a way. We held our meetings after hours. 
We continued to distribute information and share, and people got hungry for the information. So on walk day, we were all out there. See? <laughs> we were all out there in our blue shirts with giant white logos on the back. And it was an exciting time. My colleague, she was brought to tears. And I was hoping that this would be an opportunity for her to get some closure on the loss of her brother, her twin brother. So that evening, after we were all out there in our bright blue shirts with white lettering on them and a logo on the back, that evening we were on the evening news. And I mean big, big statewide news. And I thought, OK, maybe they didn't see that. It was a Sunday. <laughs> but no, the next morning, I opened the statewide newspaper. And guess who was on the front? All those blue t-shirts with big white logo on the back. And I thought, ooh, I think this might be a problem. So I slinked on into work. <laughs> that day, that Monday morning, first person who called me was the director of marketing. And he said, I can't believe you did this. But calls are coming in from all over the state. And really, Ruby, they're mostly good. The second call was from the president's office to my boss, who came and got me. And so we rode up in the elevator. He didn't say a word. His nickname was Dad. And so it was almost like we were being called to the principal's office and I was in trouble. So we got into our CEO's office, the president of the bank, and he said, to my surprise, wow, I can't believe the kind of great press we got from this. Everybody's excited about the HIV AIDS walk and the advocacy that we have done as a bank. <laughs> So I want you to know that no one will ever know that it was me who did that because they took credit and they took big credit. But I'll tell you, when you're an advocate and when you believe in a cause and it impacts thousands upon thousands of people, you need to step out front and do it. Thank you very much. talking about making radical change in unexpected ways. All right, our next storyteller is Lauren Woods. Lauren Woods, a fourth generation Chicagoan from the South Side, has cherished stories since childhood. As a mixed media artist, she carries the legacy of her family and community, weaving tales into her art that underscore our connectedness and humanity. Her work blends vibrant visuals and narratives to celebrate black culture and the bonds of family. With each piece, Lauren invites her audience to explore a world where stories are not just told, but deeply felt, connecting us all. Her story is entitled, Bravery Was Put Upon Us. Let's give it up for Lauren. There are moments when courage is required and it's not a choice. When bravery is put upon you and the only option you have is to go through it and keep living. And through living you learn that bravery by another name is obedience. In May of 1922, Elizabeth Morgan, who everyone knew as Lizzie, called her children around her bedside in her home and. Houston, Mississippi. Lizzie was a 38-year-old widowed mother of seven. Her husband, Tom McKinney, had died three years prior at the age of 38. A few, year, a few days before he passed away, he complained of unquenchable thirst and lost his eyesight. Tom and Lizzie were a farming family that worked the fields. 
Lore has it that when a white man tried to cheat Lizzie out of their cattle and refused to leave their front step, Lizzie went back into the home, got a shotgun, and let him know that he was going to leave or she was going to help him leave. Tom and Lizzie had a beautiful love affair, and like most children, like most parents, wanted nothing more than for their children to be happy and healthy and together. And so when Lizzie called her seven children, Claude, Maybell, Clarence, Lodi, Virgie, Casey, Ethel, she said, mother's not gonna make it, but you will be okay. I need you to leave here and stick together. Lizzie knew that Houston, Mississippi was not a safe place for children without their parents. She knew that if they stayed there, they would be separated. So at the age of 17, Maybelle McKinney, her eldest daughter, and my great-grandmother held the responsibility of making sure that our family left and were together. Her and her big brother, Claude, they made a promise to each other to obey their mother's wishes. Claude would go and work, look for work, and Maybelle would stay behind with her siblings. They kept that promise to one another over 20 years, moving our family from Houston, Mississippi, to Jackson, Tennessee, to where there was better work in Dyersburg, Tennessee, all the while calling for his siblings to join until everyone was ready to make that great migration from Tennessee to St. Louis, and our family settled across the Midwest in Milwaukee, St. Louis, and here in Chicago. Sometimes, bravery is just another way to say family. I come from a very long line of women who have kept living, who taught me how to live, who had bravery put upon them, and so it was this ancestral intuition that covered me and guided me when it was my turn. When I was called to my father's bedside as he was making his transition. Now, when a loved one is put on hospice, there's a nurse who comes into a room with a lot of paperwork and a lot of information. And our nurse rolled in her backpack and pulled out all these forms for my sisters and I to, to sign to let us know that we understood what was happening and that we agreed to what was happening. She gave us a pamphlet, she gave us a booklet that had a pamphlet, it had a personalized pen, it had sticky notes, it had a calendar. It had a lot of ways to tell us what happens when a loved one passes on. And of all the information she shared, I remembered that hearing is the last sense to leave. And she told us that sound stays with us until the end. And that when we have this time with our father as he's transitioning, to talk to him as if we always have. The bravest thing that I have ever had to do was have one last time with my daddy. Now, my father and I's relationship was very intentional. There has never been a time when we lived in the same state. So all of our relationship was based on conversation and we had the best conversations. And second to having the best conversations, we had a good time together. So I know this one last time when my daddy had to involve music. And so I pulled out my phone, I got on the group chat, I asked my family to send any song that they wanted him to hear, and I began playing songs that I loved that I knew that he loved. And as songs came in, every song came with a memory of how much he either loved the song or where they were together when they heard it for the first time. And I, over the next six hours, did the thing that you do when you have one last time. My mother said, leave nothing unsaid, and so I didn't. I gave promises and forgivenesses. I filled in a lot of information that I left out in stories that I should have told him. By this time, the nurse had come in with a mini boom box and a stack of CDs because she wanted me to have more options. We listened to Frankie Beverly, and because my father is a member of Omega Sci-Fi fraternity, we listened to Atomic Dog. And when it got too heavy, 
and too sad, I just put that right back on play. Halfway through Reasons by Earth, Wind and Fire, I realized two things. One, I never paid attention to the lyrics to the song before. And second, it is not an appropriate song for me to be dedicated to my father. And so we went back to listen to Atomic Dog and listen to the Commodores. Six hours later, I kissed my dad on his forehead. I took his hand, I squeezed it as hard as I could. I took my hand over his brand that at one point felt like Braille, but now had just faded into his skin. I put in the CD that the nurse gave me and I left. Sometimes bravery is just another way to say love. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Taking the stage now is Keela Moore. Keela started telling stories to improve her communication skills and fell in love with the storytelling process. She joined Soul in spring of 2023, and through this process, not only has she drastically improved her communication skills, she has also gained an understanding of the profound depth her stories can have on others. She is a Chicago native, wife and mother of two, who works as a project manager. Her story is entitled, What I Am. Let's hear it for Keela. Thank you, Emily. In my home office, I have a painting. This painting is of a beautiful black woman dressed in gold. She's staring, confident, with clear eyes, her chin jutted out. And when I look at the painting, I feel like she's a warrior, full of dedication and resiliency. And those are some of the qualities that I've tried to imbibe in myself these past few years when I've had periods of adversity. You see, I'm a black biracial woman, and so I straddle two worlds. My left foot is on the white world, the world with my mother, who worked night shift for 44 years so that she could be there for every activity, every graduation, every school pickup. Then there's also my extended family through her where they've been there for every holiday and every significant moment of my life. Then there's my right foot on the black world, the world that I was born into, the world that I grew of my own accord. It's full of the people that I found and that have found me and loved me. It's my godmothers who have given me wisdom. It's the friends that have become my sisters. It's the soul collective that has inspired me and challenged me. I love both these worlds and how I wish that they could just be one and I could feel consistently that I can be what I am. One day I signed into work and I started a meeting. I said, what's happening to the group? And I received a couple of responses of how their day was or what was going on. And then I noticed on the screen a blinking light. I was like, okay, work colleagues chatting me, let me click on it. I did, and there was just one word written, racist. I stepped back and I felt both my worlds pull apart like magnets and I struggled and I felt confused and I didn't feel I could stay on these worlds. So I held fast and I closed my eyes and I thought of the painting, the warrior spirit, the determination, the resiliency that steadied me. And I opened my eyes and I replied, what's happening isn't a racist phrase. To which my white colleague replied, oh, okay. Well, then what's happening? I just wish, I wish my two worlds could be one. I just wanna be who I am, what I am, without having to have this balancing act of the two worlds. I was shopping one day with a girlfriend of mine and we decided to go into a store that sold a lot of hats. You see, I had a hat, it was sunny out, 
So she thought, I want a hat too. So we went to the store, started looking around. I knew she was going to take some time, so I said, I'm going to wait outside. A few seconds after I left, the sales lady came up to me. She pointed at my hat and said, is that your hat? Yes, it's my hat. She looked skeptical and then said, are you sure? Yes, I am sure. It's my hat. So she turned around and went back in the store. When my friend finally left with her purchase, I told her all about what had happened. And she looked at me and said, the store does sell a lot of hats. Now this was my Blackford too. So I felt in that moment that my two worlds were pulling apart, repellent magnets. And I was struggling, I was struggling really hard. And I was thinking about a scene from The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. It's where Will and Carlton, they go and pledge a black fraternity. And then the leader says, Will, you can join, but Carlton, you're not the right sort of black. And Carlton told him, I'm not trying to be black. It's what I am. I'm running the same races and jumping the same hurdles as you. So why are you tripping me up? That's how I felt in that moment. So I thought about my painting. I'm like, mm, determination, resiliency. And I just said, if that had happened to you, you would not have thought the same thing. Oh, how I wish my two worlds could just be one. I could just be what I am. Growing up, I didn't even have a painting to help me with determination, resiliency. I felt lost. I felt confused about my identity. I didn't know anyone who had black and white parentage in my family. It was just me. I was the odd one. In my school, I was the only one as well that I knew of. The only person I did know was Mariah Carey. <laughs> but she was not in my circle. <laughs> so I felt isolated and alone. And, you know, family outings were sometimes awkward when you're the only one and people are confused. How do you fit in? Um, and being with my black family has been wonderful being part of this collective. It's helped shape me and helped fulfill me in a lot of different ways. And I do hope for all of you, just like I hope for my children, that they can be what they are. You see, they also are black biracial, but I don't want them to be known as that. I want them to be creative. I want them to be entertaining. I want them to be known as funny, hopefully successful and smart and rich, you know, but I'll, as long as they're happy, that makes me happy. But I do wish that I could be what I am and that's what I wish for all of you, that you can be truly who you are. Thank you. Give it up for Keela. I hope you all are enjoying the stories and appreciating the honesty that it takes for people to go deep and share from their hearts. Our next storyteller is Latrice Buckingham. Latrice is a multidisciplinary artist who uses storytelling, poetry, and visual art to subvert and conjure. She believes in the transformative power of art and seeks to create in the rich traditions of blackness. This is her first year with the extraordinary light that is Soul Collective. Her work can be found at artconjure.com. Let's give it up for Latrice. And the title of her story is Parable of Asada. Right? They shot her with her hands up in the chest, a bullet shattering her clavicle. Ain't no way she could have shot the trooper. They handcuffed her, slammed her, face down on the concrete, police boots to her body, feet and fists. And then they handcuffed her to the hospital bed 
beat her some more. They thought if they did all of that, she would stop. She kept going. They thought if they set her up, the state versus Joanne Chesimard, the one that posters press and bounty on her head said Asada Shakur, though, there were seven charges in total, bank robberies, kidnappings, attempted murders, and a murder. They beat her in open court, on the record, bailiff feet, bailiff fists. The judges were litigating like prosecutors, and Cousin Cohen tell Pro the witnesses were paid actors for the FBI. Can you imagine what kind of power she possessed for them to do all of that? They kept her in solitary confinement for years, men's prison after men's prison, in basements, away from human contact so long, sometimes she forgot how to talk. Centipedes crawling all over her body in more solitary confinement, inedible food in more solitary confinement. They couldn't kill her, so they kept her locked up. And she kept on believing in love and the revolution. During her last and final trial, Asada and her co-defendant, Sundiata, made a baby in the back room of the courthouse where they kept them as punishment. Can you imagine? What I'm saying is she kept going, and years go by. And one day, those feet and fists were her daughters. She was four. For four years, she had to watch her mother, mostly behind glass, no contact. This time, though, they were able to touch, and she hit her mama as hard as she could, and then she went to the prison bars with those tiny fists and hit them as hard as she could. She wanted her mama out. Asada knew in that moment she had to keep going in a whole nother way. What I'm saying is, if when confronted with injustice, if I could just muster up faith the size of Asada, I can keep going. When I'm locked in the prison of my mind and I have to riot and rage against my own thoughts, I'm too much. I'm not enough thoughts, too fat, too short, too sensitive for this world thoughts. It's because I know strength is patient. I keep going. There are people all over dealing with unimaginable horrors. These systems firmly in place committed to harm hate it when the people keep going. Do it anyway. Freedom will be waiting for you. When Asada broke out of prison, I wonder, when she slipped Past the guards and through the locked doors, was the moon high, the air clean? Did she take a deep breath and stretch, eat a good meal, make love? What's on the other side of your freedom? And what does the fight look like when you live in Congo or Sudan or Palestine or the South Side? Asada said, a wall is just a wall, nothing more at all. It can be broken down. We all got our different walls, our different fights, different ideas about freedom, but what we all got in common is to keep going. They think they can beat the love out of us, but they can't, and we know better, so we keep going. Y'all give it up for Latrice Buckingham. I hope you all are feeling inspired by the stories. I hope that the story has touched a memory or a thought inside of you. And if it has, I encourage you to share it with someone in the room during our intermission. On the next edition of The Compassionate Competitor, I'll sit in conversation with former NFL player and founder of Win Performance, Kerry Neal. Everybody want it fast. Be willing to put the work in. Join the conversation Thursday, July 25th at 7 p.m. on Can TV Cable Channel 19 or stream live on CanTV.org or the new Can TV Plus app. Elevated conversation and storytelling. Experience the power of community television. Our next storyteller is Karen Norrington Reeves. Karen is a lover of languages and a self-avowed nerd who grew up loving the written word. She believes storytelling is in the blood and bones of all people, 
but particularly those whose culture and language were taken from them. Karen is a huge fan of the Moth Radio Hour and believes that sharing our stories uplifts, affirms, and heals us all. After witnessing the beauty she found, uh, the beauty and impact of Soul Collective performance, she knew she found her people. Her dream life includes writing and telling stories, traveling the world, and one day complete competing on Jeopardy. <laughs> Karen's career has taken her from the classroom to the courtroom to the C-suite. She is the proud mother of a blended family of four who regards Mama as her favorite title <coughs> of all. She and two of her children live in Chicago's Chatham community. Her story is entitled Walking Home. For as long as I can remember, I have been terrified of death and dying. Not just like, oh, she's scared. Like, wake up in the middle of the night screaming, crying, I don't want to die, I don't want to die, I don't want to die! For most of my life. We pretty much trace this back to my very religious grandmother living with us when I was in my early childhood, trying to correct behavior and making sure that I was a good girl, because good girls didn't blow spit bubbles with their mouth. Because this devil thing awaited, it would poke you with a pitchfork, and it was terrifying to me. So fast forward, let me just clean that up a little bit. I have great memories of my grandmother, I should also say. It wasn't just the strict religious piece. Um, she taught me how to French braid and do cornrows and make greens and quiche and garden. And there's even that memory of waking up at four o'clock in the morning to watch this really important thing on television, the wedding of Princess Diana. So fast forward, February of 1996, I get the call that I had been dreading. It was time to come home and say goodbye to Granny. Her mind was starting to go, it followed her body, and she was more in the past than she was in the present. So I fly home, I go to see her at the hospital where she's just had a procedure to reinsert the feeding tube that she had pulled out. I think that was a hint. Um, and so I'm sitting at her bedside waiting for her to kind of wake up from this procedure, and at some point she opens her eyes and she meets my gaze. Hey, Granny, it's Karen. Child, I know who you are. You growed up so pretty. Thank you, Granny. I just needed to come see you. Yeah, well, you know, I'm not going to be seeing y'all in the hereafter because y'all going off to them Baptist churches, and you know the only way to Christ is through his church, the church of Christ. She was a little literal. <laughs> yes, Granny, I know, church of Christ. I love you, Granny. I love you too, sweet girl. And that was our last conversation. Seven months later, three days after my 27th birthday, she made her transition, surrounded by her children. She even held on until her only son got there. They whispered, I love you. They held her hands and I believe guided her from this plane to the next. So several years later, my father's mother, grandma, who was quite a strong woman. Um, no real formal education, but she was a poet. And she would travel throughout the community and she'd share these stories with young and old. She had some amazing, amazing poetries, just like really vivid, you know? You could just picture it, you could be in it. And so when she passed, she was again surrounded by her children. She even was aware of what was happening. She said, this is it, y'all. And she said goodbye. They said their I love yous. She got poured into and showered and supported and held, right? So recently, I became aware of this book called Walking Home, Conversations on Death and Dying. It's by Ram Das and Mirabai Bush. And in it, their position is that we're all just walking each other home. I take comfort in that, right? It doesn't sound so scary and awful. It sounds like this communal thing. I mean, I get the fact that individually it is a solitary act of dying, but there's something about being tethered to this community of people who love you. Now, my father, and 
Air Force sergeant, an Air National Guardsman, an Army guy. You see where I'm going here. He's like this grizzled soldier with a sailor's mouth who was also an artist and a lover of music and a guitarist and a beautiful singer, but he could be really profane. Um, so one of his less profane comments was, damn that, hear this. You came in this world alone, you're going to leave this world alone. And so years later, after pancreatic cancer had ravaged him and whittled his 236 pound, six foot five frame down to about 140 pounds, he said, I don't want any more tests. I'm going to hospice. I said, okay. And so I get the call. I go to visit him. And he is actively in the process of dying. So did you all know it's actually a process? It's not just like this, right? It is, it's a process. And so I walk up to him and I tap him and I say, hey, I intend to be here with you when you cross over. If you want something different, you're going to need to send me a sign and let me know, okay? And then I felt this cold brick across my back, and it was actually his arm kind of cupping me as I sat. But he was kind of not quite a fetal position, but crooked where there was enough space for me to sit there. And I sat. He talked. There were people in and out of the room. And at one point, I had to go to the bathroom. And so I leaned down to my reverent dad and said something that I knew would resonate with him. And I said, now listen, I got to go to the bathroom. You better be here when I get back. Because if you die while I'm gone, I'm going to be really pissed and I'm going to kick your ass. And so I went to the bathroom. I came back. He was still there. I felt it was my responsibility to be with him, right, in, in this, these final moments. Well, time went on. It got to be about five o'clock in the morning and the hospice nurse said, you know, he's at about 14 breaths. We still have time to go. You only live about 10 minutes away. You should go home. I'll call you when it's time for you to come back. I said, okay. Went home, slept for about three hours, got up, washed my face, the phone rang. She said, okay, you should start heading back now. He's at about 12. I said, all right, I'll be right there. Five minutes later, the phone rings. It was a different nurse. And she said, Ms. Norrington, yes? I'm just calling to let you know that your father has passed. But I was on my way! I screamed. And I continued screaming. And so I'm told my hands were flapping around and I was doing all sorts of insane things. And my best friend was there and I was telling her, it's time, get up, hurry up, we have to go, we have to go, we have to go, we have to go. And I'm screaming at her and I'm yelling at her and I'm blocking her from, she's blocking me from getting out the door because I'm trying to drive. And she's like, you're in no shape to drive. And I'm like, but you drive too slowly. And she's like, but Gooey, you cannot drive. I will drive fast, fine, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. I'm screaming at her down the highway. Because in my mind... I was thinking that if I hurried up and got there, that somehow he would not have already been gone. But you see, grief is not rational. And so we get there, and the hospice nurse looks at me and says, he didn't want you here. Excuse me? He didn't want you here. They don't go that fast. He heard me call you. I turned around. I said, oh, no, you don't. And there he went. He didn't want you here. Sometimes our love, well, I guess he's here today. Uh, <laughs> I asked for you to help me. She said, sometimes our love, our energy, our spirit holds them when they are really ready to let go. He didn't want you here. I felt it was my duty to be there, right? But he had made a choice. Now, I didn't like his choice, but I have to live with it. This past fall, my oldest child, my bonus child, my stepdaughter, who was beautiful and vivacious and smart and talented and gifted, made a choice that she was really tired of this world and was ready to go to the next. And I don't like that choice either. But I realized the thing that 
bothers me the most about it is that we weren't there. We weren't there to offer her comfort. We weren't there to support her. We weren't there to tell her how loved she was. And so I've made a choice, and I'm hoping that God will honor it. My choice is that when it's my time, I want to be surrounded by the people I have loved, that I have poured into and who poured into me in return. I want there to be stories. I want you to tell all the things, the good, the bad, the ugly. I want there to be laughter. I want there to be shared memories. And most of all, I want you to hold my hand and tell me you love me and walk me home. Because then, maybe just then, it won't be so scary after all. Thank you. Y'all give it up for Karen. A story is a powerful thing because it gives us an opportunity to see that we are connected in ways that we might not even imagine. And it also gives us an opportunity to understand ourselves and each other more deeply. Our next storyteller is the co-founder of Soul Collective, Shelley A. Davis. In 2017, Shelley A. Davis became inspired to become a storyteller while she was driving down the highway crying and listening to an NPR radio story. In 2020, she co-founded Soul Collective, an organization of women of color focused on putting their voices at center stage to celebrate their own truths. Shelley's stories are true personal essays. She became a storytelling performer because she believes that storytelling is a way to transmit humor, love, and insight. Shelley is a Southside Chicago native. She lives with her husband and two teenage children in Bronzeville in an 1889 brownstone that always needs more work. <laughs> Her story is entitled, A Night at the Ballet. It was Easter 2020, month into the shutdown. We tried to make it special. We zoomed into church. Omar made a big meal. I pulled out the china. We sat down with our two kids at the dining room table. We put a Bluetooth speaker in the middle of the table, and we took turns calling family members. We called Aunt Betty, Omar's oldest aunt on his mother's side. And she's telling stories, and we're laughing, and we're talking, and we're visiting. And they said, hey, Aunt Betty, guess what? This year, I'm going to be 50. And she said, oh, 50. 50 is the best. You know what happens when you're 50? You can do whatever you want to do. <laughs> so if someone calls and says, come on, come with me to see that play, and you don't want to see that play, you could just say, I don't want to see that play. <laughs> Fast forward to this spring, I bought myself a ticket to the ballet with the special pre-reception, the ladies' reception. I get to the reception, I don't know anybody. There's two groups of women. There are the older ladies that are sipping Chardonnay. I talk to them first. They are, oh, so excited about the show. I mean, have you read the reviews? I saw pictures of the dress rehearsal. The dancers are in nude leotard and tights, and some of their moves look a little erotic. After I'd heard that story like three times, I was like, okay, that's interesting. I switched groups. I went to the younger ladies. Now, the younger women, they were pounding champagne as fast as the open bar would let them. They were taking thousands of pictures for Instagram. They were so much more fun. I fell into a group. There was a Scots woman. She introduced herself. She told me she had social anxiety and that these big reception things were really a lot for her. And there was a younger black woman who works for a high-end athletic wear company whose founding CEO said really disparaging things about the diversity of women's bodies, even though it was his factory 
that made his pants see through. So we drank champagne, we took pictures for Instagram, we laughed, we talked. I told them about what the, sh the Chardonnay sipping ladies said. And then the lights flickered and we walked into the theater and we sat separately scattered across the theater. So the show starts and I don't know what happened. I mean, the stage was filled with hay, you know, the things that horses eat. And the dancers are dancing across the hay and then they're burying themselves in the hay and then they're throwing the hay up as if it's raining and then they mop the hay across the stage. I just stopped paying attention after a while. I decided to think about myself. You see, these past six months have been really difficult. We've had lots of health crises in our family. We, I was thrown into a job transition that nobody can quite be prepared for. And I've gotten lots of support, and, and, but some of the messages that I get have just been a little too much. Like, you're so strong. Not everybody is as strong as you. Or, you really took one for the team. You took one for all of us. Or, you really have a backbone. You really know how to stand up for your values. And all of these messages of resilience just keep waiting on my shoulders and I keep wondering, when do I get a break? When do I get a moment of ease? The lights came up, it was intermission. I flow into the lobby, I find my new friends, the Scots woman and the black woman. We go up to the bar and what do we do? Of course, drink more champagne. And we sit down and the black woman says, do you guys have a friend that I can meet? And the Scots woman said, would you be interested in meeting my friend named Claude? And the black woman says, Claude, that's a nice name. Does Claude like to bone? Because I really want to bone. Now I have no idea what my face looked like, but in my head I was like, what did she just say? And does a Scots woman with social anxiety know what bone means? Like, do I have to translate? No, it only took a beat and the Scots woman said, well, if I wasn't married, I would bone Claude. <laughs> Apparently, no translation needed. So they're just talking, and I'm like, wow, that just happened. The lights flicker. It's time for the second half. I said, come on, guys. Let's see what the Chardonnay sipping ladies were talking about. I settled back down into my seat. And, I mean, you may be wondering. Like, I was curious about what the Chardonnay ladies were talking about. I also have never left a show. Like, never, you know, who cares if I didn't like it? I bought the ticket. I settled into my seat. I think maybe the second half will be more interesting than the first half. No. <laughs> I mean, I really don't know what happened in the second half at all. I can't even tell you. I mean, there were the nude color leotard and tights, and maybe there were some erotic moves, but haven't we all seen that before? This time when I settled into my own thoughts, I turned to gratitude and I thought about all the ways in the past few months I've been held. I open up my email and there's an invitation saying, be my guest at this lunch or this dinner and it opens up a new avenue of networking or someone says, hey, you know, I have this stipend money, come and speak to my class, these business students or come and sit in this co-working space with my team so you don't have to be isolated in your home office. A little while ago, I was sitting in that co-working space and a friend walked from around the corner and she was completely refreshed. She had just come back from her sabbatical and she says, look at you, Shelly. You're doing exactly what you want to do. And I thought, well, what am I doing? I mean, I just got off a of Zoom. I got to get on another Zoom. I'm just sitting here daydreaming about what's possible. And she said, exactly. You're doing exactly what you want to do. 
The lights came up, the ballet was over. I go out into the hall, I look for my new friends, the Scots woman and the black woman, and they weren't there. I think they skipped the second half. I think they went to find Claude. <laughs> I walked out into the street and chuckled to myself about Claude and hoped that he's everything that we promised he would be. <laughs> but really, I thought about Aunt Betty's message and my friend's message and all the ways community is held. And, realized that that night I sat in a beautiful historic theater. I listened to gorgeous classical music. I got to be still and I got to do exactly what I wanted to do. Thank you. Y'all give it up for Shelly Davis. All right. Our next storyteller is Terry A. Johnson. Terry has written stories since she was a child. She began telling them when she joined the Soul Collective in 2020. Using her voice to speak truth to power is at the center of her work, both personal and professional. A second generation Southsider, she is a fusion of public schools, free street theater, basement house and funk parties, <laughs> black church pews, Harold's mild sauce, and Gladys's catfish and spaghetti. Her story is entitled, My New Life as a Bald Badass. Let's give it up for Terry A. Johnson. Chemo messed me up, and I have a lengthy list of her crimes against my body, but I'm only gonna share one. It took away almost all of my hair, and I do mean all of it, in places I forgot I had hair, <laughs> except for a few lashes and a bit of brow that are holding on for dear life. I was prepared more or less to lose my hair. It's one of the few consistent things on the list that they give you and all the articles that you read about how to prepare yourself when they diagnose you with cancer. And I've always had a casual relationship with my hair. It's never been a long-term commitment. It's been a series of flings. <laughs> my hair has been long, it's been short, it's been curly, it's been straight, it's been natural, it's been processed. It's been a lot of shades of brown, shades of red. It's been black, almost blonde. So I thought, <laughs> I got this. It's just hair, right? And I was fine. I was fine for a really long time until I started to wake up in the morning and my pillowcase looked like a Muppet. And I got sad. I, I was surprised that I got sad because I didn't really know if I was sad because I was losing my hair, or if I was losing control. My barber, who until tonight has been an unsung hero in my journey, he planned a farewell tour of sorts. We'd take a little bit off and minimize the trauma. And then one day, it was time to say the final goodbye. He grabbed his clippers. We both held our breath, because we didn't know what I was going to look like when it was over. Was I gonna be strong and sexy and sleek like Grace Jones? Or was I gonna be regal like that photograph of Cicely Tyson that I grew up with? Or was I gonna be a lumpy Scotty Pippen? <laughs> well, you know, it's fine. My head shape is fine. My head is a lot bigger than I thought it was. And I do look like an alien. I had done some research because I was trying to get ready and I went to the wonderful world of wigdom. And I don't know if you've ever visited this place, but it is vast and it is overwhelming and it is really expensive. And I wasn't sure that I was gonna commit to a wig, so I thought, okay, I'm gonna grab two testers from Amazon. One was brown and synthetic, the other one was black and human hair. They were both short. 
and I look like dead white men in both of them. <laughs> Pop culture icons, but dead white men nonetheless. I look like either Ringo Starr from the Beatles or Mo from the Three Stooges. <laughs> either way, not good looks. And they were not comfortable. They were hot, they were itchy, it felt like somebody was scraping my scalp, so I'm not gonna be able to wig. So let's try the headscarf route. I don't know if you've seen these, especially the ones that are targeting chemo patients. Lots of prints, and they are not pretty. They look like 1960s, 1970s wallpaper, or your grandmother's house coat, or Aunt Bertha's house coat, and not the cute one. And they're really big. They're unisex, so they have to um, fit a lot of different head sizes. And my head is big, but it is not that big. So I'm not gonna be able to wear a hot hair hat, and I'm not gonna be able to wear an extra large Victorian tapestry, so I'm gonna have to face the world bald. Now I made that decision, but I wasn't completely convinced it was the right one. I was nervous, what was gonna happen? When I went outside, were adults gonna do double takes, spit takes? Were children gonna scream in horror? Were dogs gonna chase me? Was the light from my shiny head gonna blind passing cyclists or drivers? Were birds and insects gonna try to land on this dome? What was gonna happen? Nothing happened. Nobody recoiled in horror, nobody screamed, nobody noticed, and when they did and they commented on it, they were actually really kind. I felt less alien, a little more avant-garde, a little androgynous, maybe even a little beautiful. Being hairless has lots of perks. My shower time is cut in half. <laughs> I'm not spending any more time, energy, and money on hair care products or trying to figure out when can I make that appointment for my grooming and my waxing. None of that. It is cold. Being bald is very cold. And the time that I gained in my shower routine, I've lost because now I need to put on full face makeup, which is a ritual I stopped in my 30s. But if I don't put on a brow and a little bit of lash and a pop of color on my mouth and full face foundation, I don't feel human. I feel a bit like an unfinished sketch. And feeling human is really important when I feel sick and weak and tired. Since I've faced the world bald, people have been calling me brave. And you get called brave a lot when you're fighting cancer. And I so appreciate the kindness and the support and the love that is in that sentence. But I don't feel brave. I'm just getting up every day. I don't feel like the fierce warrior woman that other people see. I'm just making choices. Wig, no wig. Hair scarf, no head scarf. How much am I gonna tell people about what this disease is doing to me? Am I gonna cry? Am I gonna rage with anger? Or am I just gonna laugh at the absurdity of so much of this? Am I gonna give in to my fear or lean into my faith? Am I gonna hold on to gratitude? That's my daily dance. But because people have been calling me brave so often, I've been doing a lot of thinking about what does it mean to be brave? What does it take to be brave? And there are lots of ways to do it. And I don't think heroes always feel heroic. But I do think there's one important thing that we can do. We can get up every day and make our choices, our authentic choices. The ones that are about who we are, and how we want to live in this precious and fragile life. How are we going to show up? That is what makes us unstoppable, and that is brave. Thank you for listening.
Our final individual storyteller is our host, Emily Hooper Lansana, the artistic director of Soul Collective. For more than 30 years, Emily has performed, curated, and taught storytelling. She often performs with her performance duo in the spirit. Her storytelling has taken her to stages across the country. Her work seeks to give voice to those whose stories are often untold, especially those of the African diaspora. She is honored to be a 2021 Three Arts Award recipient. Emily is a proud mother of four powerful sons and one amazing granddaughter. Emily's story is entitled Black Mama Magic. Becoming a mother turned me into a warrior. I don't think I planned it, and I certainly didn't know it was coming. Before I had my first child, I did, like, I'm, I'm kind of a nerd in the study things way, so I got books on everything, how to have a smarter baby and what to expect when you're expecting and all of that, but there isn't a book that says what to expect when you're expecting a black boy in a country that does not love them. Now... My boys were beautiful babies. Now, I know everybody says that, but I'm telling the truth. <laughs> and I remember being in the store with my oldest and a white woman looking at him and saying, oh my, what a beautiful baby. And I looked at her and I thought, yes, I know that. But for how long will you say that? And at what point will it be when he's five or when he's 10 or when he's 15 that you will turn and grab your purse and cross the street? And how do I prepare him for that? There have been so many battles that I had to fight that called up the warrior in me. I'm thinking of when I went to pick up my youngest from school, he had been having some difficulty in one of his classes, and I said to the white male teacher, I'm thinking if you could send the assignments home, we could try them at home, and I could see at what point he is getting confused. And he looked at me and said, the problem is that he's lazy. That's what's wrong with him. And I looked at him, and I thought, I could destroy you. And the level that of anger that is in my body right now would have me strangle you, knock you down, and step all over you. But you are not worth my time. My child is more important. And what I know is that he will never come back to this school. You see, sometimes you have to decide which fight to fight and how you're going to fight it. Now, I'm thinking of the time after Trayvon Martin was killed and we were waiting to hear the verdict, I was in Whole Foods with all of my sons and I looked into the eyes of a, another black woman who was shopping and there was a horror that came over her face. And she said to me, they let him off. And I knew exactly what she was talking about and I burst into tears. And after that, I wanted to keep all my sons in the house and not leave home. But you can't just stay in the house. At some point, you have to go outside. So I said, okay, we're going to go to some place that has been a happy place for us. My youngest loved trains. So I said, we're going to go to the train room at the Museum of Science and Industry. So we went to the train room. And, you know, there's a big empty train car in the back. So we were all sitting in the train car and talking and laughing and having a good time. And this couple comes into the train car. And they're looking around like they've lost something. And I don't want to be in the way of them looking. So I tell my crew, let's get out of here. Let's go to the next room. So we're standing by the baby chicks where you watch to see the eggs hatch. And the woman who was looking around the train car comes up to one of my sons and says, my phone is missing. Can I look in your pockets? And I look at her and I think, I could destroy you. 
I could strangle you and step all over you, but you are not worth my time. I said, get away from us right now before I have you destroyed for harassment. Get away. I was quite honestly less concerned about her than I was concerned about the fact that he immediately went to open his pockets. I didn't want him to do that. You know, in Chicago, one of the places that we think is a safe place is the lake. And often that freedom that you feel when you're at the lake with your family, there's not quite anything like it. And um, a couple years ago, one of my sons had driven to the lake to have a moment of peace. He had, you know, been there with some friends and he got ready to leave. And a white woman backed into his car and there was no damage, but um, he wanted to make sure that the situation was addressed. And so he had looked for security and called for someone to come and tried to speak to her because remember, she hit his car and she wouldn't get out of her car. And when the police officer finally arrived, she got out of her car and she said, it's my word against his, who are you gonna believe? And I wasn't so angry about her as I was angry, you don't get to take the lake from us. That's ours. You don't get to take that freedom of being in a place that we feel like is ours. That is what made me angry. So yes, being a black mama has forced me into being a warrior, but just as much as I have been a warrior in those moments where I had to fight and I didn't wanna fight, I'm a warrior on the other side of celebration. I counted it up and I believe that I may truly have held 87 birthday parties so that every single one of all four of them could be celebrated. And every time there is an accomplishment, I am trying to make sure that not only I'm there, but our whole circle of friends and family are there to say, we see you, we love you, we celebrate you, you are important, you matter. Yes. Sometimes the being a warrior means that we have to stand up and let each other know that the love that we have is bigger than the hatred that we sometimes face. Black Mama Magic, thank you. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. I'd like to call the Women of Soul Collective to the stage. Uh, what a powerful and transformative night this has been. On behalf of Soul Collective, I'd like to extend a sincere thanks to our donors, Hetherington Family Foundation, Lynx Hall, Reva and David Logan Center for the Arts, Illinois Humanities, and the team here at Can TV for such an incredible platform. To our wonderful studio audience, you all, and to each of you for watching, for spending some of our precious time your precious time listening to our stories. We hope that you are inspired to make radical change in unexpected ways. We are grateful to all of the unstoppable warriors in our lives. And I'd like to give it up for Terry Johnson, Karen Norrington Reeves, Kara Irvin, Latrice Buckingham, Keela Moore, Ruby Houghton Pitts, Shelly A. Davis, and Lauren Woods. We are so collective. We hope that you go out and celebrate an unstoppable warrior, and we hope that you make some radical change in unexpected ways. Thank you for being here.